<laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'd uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for doing this, but I think the organizers are Renzo and, and Renzo. So I'd like to thank Renzo uh, for this terrific conference. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, uh, this is not a Helicity or Carl Eigenfields or Beltrami Fields talk, um, although I'll say a few words about relationships uh, between the things. Um, but it's been a real pleasure to see all the work that's been done uh, since I started thinking about that uh, like 20 years ago. Um, so uh, so thank you all for enlightening me. Um, so, OK, so today's work is uh, joint with Henrik Schumacher, um, who's at Chemnitz. Um, and what we're going to talk about is polygon spaces. So here's the idea. Um, suppose you have a polymer model and you want something like a freely jointed chain. So there are going to be a lot of steps, uh, but instead of sampling the steps from a Gaussian as one does in a large scale model, you want to sample the steps so that each step has exactly the same length, or perhaps it has lengths which are decided in advance by you like one, 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 two, or something like that. So uh, perhaps in two dimensions, they form some linkage, or in three dimensions, they form a knot. And the first thing I want to do is say, well, uh, I don't care about where it's located in space, so just up to translation, it's determined by the steps themselves. Mm -hmm. And this is a model of various physical systems, right? Uh, for the planar linkage, these are often used in engineering or mechanism design. They're uh, great examples in topology uh, where people like to compute the homology groups of linkage spaces and so forth. In three dimensions, they're knots, but you know, what about 11 dimensional polygons or 26 dimensional polygons or seven dimensional polygons? Uh, if you really understand a theory, it should work in any dimension D, uh, and then you should be able to study what happens as the dimension changes. So, uh, so here's a picture, right? Uh, I'm a geometer, so I want to put a metric on the space of polygons. Um, and the natural metric for me is a submanifold of a product of spheres. So, each edge points in some direction on the sphere. And if we say that a polygon with different edge lengths is closed, what we mean is some linear combination of these displacement vectors is zero. So I have a product of spheres, and I want to cut it by a linear space of co-dimension D or something. And whatever that resulting possibly singular manifold is, I'd like to understand its geometry, construct random samples, navigate around in it, uh, solve numerical problems on it, and so forth. So here you see uh, a planar polygon, and the little dots on the circle plot um, at the right um, are the directions of the edges. And on the left, you see what happens when I add those up one after the other. Because the point cloud on the right has center of mass at the origin, the polygon on the left closes. And if the center of mass of the point cloud was not at the origin, that would determine the failure to close of the polygon. There would be that much distance between the ends when you were done. Hmm. So, you have this picture where there's a product of spheres, and inside this product of spheres, there's a manifold you like. But a, And certainly you can define a metric this way. Uh, the product of spheres is a natural metric, and this subspace, which is uh, at least almost everywhere a manifold, has a natural submanifold metric on it. And that defines a volume form and a geometry and distances and so forth. But that's not necessarily very accessible. Um, just because you slice a product of high dimensional spheres with a hyperplane doesn't mean that you understand the resulting thing you get very well. So what I want to do is I want to define 
a sort of retraction from the product of spheres to the closed polygons. And the idea is that if you're given an open polygon, uh, like a polygonal arm, you want to turn it into a closed polygon. And you can think of various ways you might do this. For instance, uh, let's say one end of the chain has a positive charge and the other end of the chain is a negative charge. And so they attract each other. And then they follow some constrained flow where in the middle, the edge lengths stay the same. And by the time the flow gets done, you've arrived at something where the two ends link up and now you've got a, a closed polygon. So any sort of map like that would define some kind of retraction from open to closed polygons. For instance, you could take the nearest closed polygon in Euclidean space or in the metric on the product of spheres. But what you'd like is for this to have nice properties. And that's hard to do with an ad hoc algorithm. So one comment is that the homotopy types of the polygon spaces are pretty well known and they are not the homotopy type of a product of spheres. So if you're going to define some deformation retraction from one space to the other, you better cut out a singular set from the product of spheres. Otherwise, you have no chance. Um, so in my construction, uh, the singular polygons are going to be basically the ones where too much of it points in the same direction. Uh, for instance, the straight lines. And you can already see the problem, right? It's easy to curl this up into a triangle, but do you go left or right? But once you go off the straight configuration, now it's determined. The symmetry has been broken and you know which way to go to get the rest of the way towards closure. So here's a picture of this thing closing and then it ends on the submanifold of closed polygons. Mm. So whatever this process is, it's a natural way to go from open to closed and it allows things like complete revolutions of some of the links when you need to do that. Mm. So how can I define such a thing? Well, here's where it gets fun uh, because I'm going to introduce a new differential geometric structure, which will turn out to make everything uh, much more understandable. So the geometric structure I want to introduce here is hyperbolic geometry um, in the Poincaré disk model. So the idea is that um, the sphere represents points at infinity. These are ideal points in hyperbolic geometry. The ball is like hyperbolic d-dimensional space. And inside the ball, there's some geometry where the geodesics are circles that meet the boundary sphere at right angles. Um, and angles are correct. And distances are scaled by something that depends on the Euclidean distance from the origin. So here you see a hyperbolic triangle. Um, its angles are correct, and as you expect in hyperbolic geometry, they sum to less than pi. Mm. Now, the group of isometries for this hyperbolic model are the conformal transformations which preserve the sphere, which is to say the Mobius group. Um, so I, I know many of you uh, know Rob Kussner. So Rob always says that everything reduces to the conformal group. And this is an instance of Kostner's theorem, I guess, because the conformal transformations turn out to be the important thing about the whole story. <laughs> so here's a construction. Um, at any point in hyperbolic space, if I have an ideal direction, a direction on the sphere at infinity, there's some unique geodesic that goes there. Right, so in our space, we think about looking in some direction in the sky and seeing eventually that direction on the sort of sphere at infinity. So here, um, I've kind of compactified things by restricting them to, this, to the unit ball. And the directions which go to the sphere at infinity are these circles, which come from where I am to this point on the boundary sphere, and they meet the boundary sphere at a right angle. 
So that defines at each point in space a unit tangent vector to this geodesic, which I call the director. So the director is which way you go Euclideanly to get to that point at infinity. And notice that it doesn't follow the straight line from say W to X1, it follows some circle. Now, uh, Duati and Earl in the 80s made this really interesting construction of a sort of hyperbolic center of mass of points at infinity. And the way it works is that you find a point in the hyperbolic space so that the sum of the directors is zero. Um, and at that point, you see these uh, stars, X1 through X3, evenly spaced around you as you look around. Um, and you could weight the points if you like, which I would very much like to do. And you get in that tangent space at the point W, uh, the sum you're looking for, that the weighted sum of the unit director vectors is zero. So uh, let me just point out one more thing about this picture. Um, over here, this is like an open polygon. These three edge directions don't sum to zero. Over here, this is like a closed polygon. These three edge directions do sum to zero. So this is like finding out which equilateral triangle uh, is supposed to be associated with this open arm given by X1, X2, and X3. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this doesn't always work, and the way it can fail is if there's so much mass at some point on the sphere at infinity that it's more than half the total mass, right? In that case, there's no way you're going to get everything else to balance that out and get a vector sum of zero. Um, so we're going to say that a weighted point cloud is stable if no point supports half or more of the total mass. Mm. And Duati and Earl showed that every stable point cloud has a unique conformal barycenter. So if you look at the picture, um, here's a stable point cloud. Um, these things actually all have equal masses because it makes the picture look nicer, but they don't have to. Um, and here's their conformal barycenter. Um, if you add up the unit tangents to all these circles, you get zero. Um, now, if you think about this, these directions, these directors pointing to points on the sphere at infinity don't change as you move around by a hyperbolic isometry. It's sort of like if you look up at a star, it's so far away that if I go to the other side of town, I'll see the star in the same position on the sphere at infinity. Uh, if I go very far away, I'll see the star at the same position on the sphere at infinity. So here, this is literally true. Uh, if I take a hyperbolic isometry, I have to transform the geodesics and the director field and the points at infinity by that same hyperbolic isometry. So here I'm close to the boundary. So in my Euclidean model, it looks like these points at infinity are on the left-hand side of the, the circle. Here I'm close to infinity on the other direction, and it looks like my points are on the right-hand side of the circle. Of course, from my own perspective at this point, things always look the same. Um, now, uh, and the sum is always zero, right? The sum of the directors at the conformal barycenter is zero in all three of these pictures. Mm. All right, but we didn't want a sum of directors, we wanted a sum of vectors. Um, and the one place that the Euclidean vectors x1 through xn and the hyperbolic directors vx1 through vxn match up is at the origin. If I'm at the origin, the geodesics really are straight lines to the, to the sphere at infinity. So what I'd like is to say that um, if my conformal barycenter is the origin in the Poincaré disk, then the Euclidean sum of the points at infinity is zero. 
And of course it's weighted too, right? So the weighted Euclidean sum, if I want it, of the points at infinity is zero. So I'm gonna call those point clouds centered. Their Euclidean center of mass and their conformal hyperbolic center of mass are both at the origin. Now, centered, polygon, centered point clouds are like closed polygons. Um, and the beautiful thing now uh, is that I can move the conformal barycenter around by hyperbolic isometry. Yeah. So if I define the hyperbolic translation uh, to be uh, just notationally this sigma s, map, um, that's going to be the hyperbolic translation which maps S to the Euclidean origin. Um, this is some Mobius transformation of the ball. And I can say that the conformal centering map uh, just takes the conformal barycenter of the point cloud to the Euclidean origin. Um, and here we go. Um, let's connect this back to polygons. So if I have a collection of lengths that I would like to see in my closed polygon, well, they can't be of the form 1117 because there is no closed polygon with edge lengths 1, 1, 1, and 7. It doesn't obey the triangle inequality. So therefore, uh, I'll require my edge lengths to be stable, which is to say no edge length is more than the sum of all the other edge lengths, right? You can always get that. And given that, uh, we can say that directions are stable if the weighted point cloud is stable. So it's a combination of which way you're pointing and what your edge lengths are. Mm. Um, so here we have some stable edge lengths with an unstable direction. That's where they're all pointing in the same direction and the same stable edge lengths with a stable direction. So the theorem is that uh, given fixed stable edge lengths, um, there is a closure for every set of stable directions. Um, and it's gonna work like this. Um, I start out with a bunch of uh, points on the circle, which represent directions I'm gonna step in. That's this open polygon on the left-hand side of the screen. Now I'm going to use a hyperbolic translation to move the conformal barycenter to the origin. And as I do it, I'm gradually going to close the polygon. So here's the closed one. Here is the open one. And every open polygon that points in stable directions can be uniquely associated with a given closed polygon that I get by translating the conformal barycenter hyperbolically to the origin. So now I've got a much better picture. Um, the first thing I've proved is I know what the singular set is. So the singular con set, set consists of stable direct, uh, blah. The singular set consists of unstable directions. Everything else, the stable directions, deformation retracts to the polygon space. So if I want to know what the space of equilateral seven gons in R5 looks like, uh, I say, OK, I have a product of four spheres. Those represent the directions. Uh, I take that product of seven four spheres, and I subtract all the diagonals where four points or more are at the same location. Those are the unstable directions. One point on the four sphere has mass four, and now the other three can't close it. And that's it. That is the homotopy type of that particular set of equilateral polygons. Um, you can probably use this to compute the homology groups and so forth in general. Um, I haven't done so uh, because that's not quite my game, but I hope someone else does. <laughs> uh, however, we've got now a picture that's geometrically interesting to me where you have unstable directions, stable directions, and over each closed polygon a fiber that's always diffeomorphic to the ball. So, 
everybody gets the same set the same topology set of open polygons associated to them. It's not the same measure, um, but it's still nice. Um, and I know how to get from closed to open and back again. Okay, well, uh, of course, to make this work in practice, you have to find the conformal barycenter. Um, so this will require some fun numerics. Um, because you'd like to find it fast, you'd like to find it stably, and you'd like to prove that you can find it uh, because you're going to prove some theorems about how well this works. And of course, to do that, you have to prove that your numerics converge. Uh, so here we go. Um, if you define a function to be uh, the weighted sum of the directors, you've defined some vector valued function on the disk. Fair enough. So finding the conformal barycenter is finding the place where that vector valued function is a zero, right? You're looking for a zero for your vector field. To find zeros for a vector field, you can use Newton's method. Um, as long as you can compute the derivative of the vector field, uh, you can do some update where you invert the matrix, multiply it by the current value, sub get a direction to move in, and then go in that direction. You just have to do all this Ramanianly now, uh, which is where it gets fun. So instead of taking the gradient, you take the covariant derivative, or the, the usual differential, you take the covariant differential. And then instead of moving in a straight line, you move by the exponential map, which is to say you move along the geodesic in that direction. Um, for the appropriate distance. And it turns out that we can compute uh, the differential, the covariant derivative of this director map. Uh, and it turns out to be really nice, right? So you have the identity matrix minus a weighted sum of vectors times their transposes. So uh, physicists in the audience, um, you should think about like where you've seen this before, uh, because I'm going to ask you about it later and some variations which I don't understand. Mm -hmm. So, okay, but Newton's method is unstable, right? Uh, everybody's seen that picture where you iterate Newton's method and you get some weird fractal. So, uh, the thing that numerics people know very well, um, and you can also use this technique in PDE and to construct uh, vector fields satisfying a PDE and so forth, is that uh, Kantorovich's theorem says that if you can bound the Lipschitz constant of the differential and the value of the function, uh, and the uh, Sorry, if the if the differential is Lipschitz, you can bound its operator norm at a point, and you know the function value at a point, you know there's a unique solution within a certain distance of where you are now, and you know that Newton's method will get to it quadratically. So this is Kantorovich's theorem. So uh, we're gonna prove that our Newton iteration will work using the Ramanian Kantorovich theorem. Um, and Here's what you get. Um, this mysterious quantity, right, is just the inertial tensor. So you take your initial point cloud, you take its inertial tensor, um, and you take this matrix A and you take the first eigenvalue of the inertial tensor, the smallest one. So what that's saying is don't have all your points concentrated too close to a line because that would have a zero moment of inertia, and that would be bad, right? Don't have them contained in a subspace. Um, so if you have a bound on the lowest moment of inertia, um, and you have a bound on where the Euclidean center of mass is of your initial configuration, then you can prove that this Ramanian Newton iteration will converge um, and actually we have an explicit bound on how fast it converges. It reduces the geodesic distance between your guess and the conformal barycenter to within epsilon. Uh, 
in log log epsilon minus log log of this sort of uh, Newton Kantorovich factor Q that's defined here in terms of the center of mass and the moment of inertia. Um, uh, and sort of log log epsilon minus log log Q steps. Mm -hmm. OK, well, when does this happen, right? You need your Q to be good. But your Q is determined by the lowest moment of inertia and your Euclidean center of mass. And of course, if you start out with a random arm, uh, both those things are good for you, right? It's almost certain that a random collection of points on a D-sphere won't be contained in a lower dimensional subspace. That's like some measure zero condition. It's also almost sure that the center of mass of a randomly chosen set of points will be close to the origin. Um, this was one of the original tests for points being uniformly distributed in, in spatial statistics, right? In directional statistics is find the center of mass. If it's too far from the origin, these points were not uniformly selected on the two sphere. So if you look at these pictures, you can say, oh, here's 10 points on the sphere. Uh, the typical case is the, the lowest moment of inertia is like about 0.5. Uh, the center of mass is about 0.2 away from the, the origin. Here is 100 points. Um, the lowest moment of inertia is 0.6. Um, the center of mass is within 0.05. And here's 1,000 points. Again, the the moment of inertia is about the same. It's 0.64, and the center of mass is again closer. Mm -hmm. So this happens almost all the time. Uh, and in fact, we can prove this, that it's exponentially likely that a randomly selected starting configuration will obey our newton kantorovich conditions. So it's very hard to find a set. It's very hard to find an open polygon that's difficult to close. Mm -hmm. Open polygons that are difficult to close are very, very special. Um, and these are just some example data. Um, uh, let's see, so if you wanted Q to be um, at least a half, uh, this is the probability you're looking here. Uh, Q is less than a half, uh, Q is really, I always get this backwards. Mm. Okay, I'm not going to try to figure it out on the fly. This graph shows that it almost always works. Mm. Okay, so um, this convergence is really fast. So if you want to do it in double precision, which is to say within an error of 10 to the minus 16, uh, if Q is less than a half, you're guaranteed to do that on the sixth iteration of the method. So you, you have to do it a very small number of times. Uh, and each step, well, it requires you to uh, compute some D by D matrices, which take n order of n time to find, assemble some covariant derivatives, which again involves the inertial tensor, that's quick as well. And then finally, you have to find some eigenvalues for a D by D matrix. So if you add it all up, it's O of N if the dimension is fixed and O of D squared N if the dimension is changing. Okay, but suppose you got really unlucky and you found some place where the newton kantorovich conditions don't hold. Um, this is really unlikely and we didn't technically need to do this for the theorem we wanted to prove, but we couldn't resist. Uh, so we proved um, at great cost uh, that if you use a damped regularized Newton's iteration, you are guaranteed to converge whenever there is a conformal barycenter. Um, and it required the following interesting insight. This director function fx is actually the gradient of a potential function. And that potential function is Euclideanly not very nice, but it's hyperbolically convex. Mm. Um, so you can plot the level sets 
and they can look sort of strange from a Euclidean point of view. But if you realize that you're moving along these circle arcs, it's convex with respect to these circle arcs. And so we could use uh, theorems in, in convex optimization to show that you get to the right place in the end. OK, so now what do we want to do? Um, we want to say, I want to sample closed polygons. Um, and how do I want to sample closed polygons? I want to generate open polygons because that's fast. I'll just take a uniform collection of identically uh, independent, uh, independent, identically distributed samples on the D sphere. And then I'll add them up to get an open polygon and then I'll close it with my conformal barycenter closure algorithm. And if I do so, I'll generate closed polygons, but with some weird weights, right? Because I didn't sample along the submanifold, I sampled in the big manifold and I pushed it down to the closed guys. So I need to correct for the bias in my, in my closure procedure. And what's amazing is that you can actually do this, right? So if you think about what's required um, to compute weighting factors for a reweighted sampling algorithm, you have to think of all the open polygons which go to a particular closed polygon. And then you have to differentiate the closed polygon with respect to a variation of the open polygon. If you're closing by some energetic procedure, taking that derivative is a bad, bad thing, right? And even here, I don't have a formula for where the conformal barycenter is, right? So how do I know the derivative of the conformal barycenter with respect to the point cloud on the sphere? Um, that still seemed very hard. Um, and for a year or two, I would sit down to work on this problem and I just say, nope. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to compute the derivative of the conformal barycenter with respect to variations. How would I even know where to start? There's no formula. What am I differentiating? Um, and then uh, I'll show you in a sec the key insight. Um, but it turns out that the reweighting factors, which include uh, implicitly this mysterious derivative, are actually quite explicit. Um, here's the inertial tensor again, the determinant of the inertial tensor of the closed polygon is involved. The determinant of this funny matrix related to the closed polygon is involved. So this is my question for the, the physicists is when in physics do you have something like the inertial tensor? but you weight it by the square of the masses rather than the masses themselves. Is that ever a thing that one does? Or is this just a matrix that happened to come up when we were differentiating? If you knew these two matrices, uh, you could take the ratio of their determinants. Notice that I have to take the square root of the determinant below to get the units right, because this scales with R squareds. So I have to take the square root to compare to the determinant of A, which scales with R's. And then I multiply by this term, uh, which is a product of things involving the relationship between the conformal barycenter and the edges of the closed polygon. Um, so this is a perfectly explicit product uh, that can be done in O of N time. Mm -hmm. If I compute these things, then I have the reweighted sampling theorem that I want, that um, the sample mean divided by the sum of the weights, right? So this is the, the weighted sample mean converges to the integral mean. That's what this little slash denotes. I'm, I'm told that this is very common in Europe, uh, but uh, it is not common uh, when I learned probability. So I was like, wow, there's a symbol for that. Um, so the little slash means mean. Um, so the mean of the function, the, the reweighted sample mean converges to the actual function mean, uh, which is cool because it means 
we can now compute expectations and moments of any quantity for fixed length polygons in any dimension. Uh, and we can do it rapidly. Uh, I'll show later that the convergence rate uh, is quite fast as n goes to infinity. So how do you get these weights, right? How do you take the untakeable derivative? Here's the point. Don't think about closing an open polygon. Think about opening a closed polygon. That's the inverse map. So given a closed polygon and uh, some point in the ball, we can generate the corresponding open polygon by translating the origin to that point in the ball. That gives me an open polygon which would have closed to get this guy. <laughs> that is to say, I know explicitly a formula for the inverse of conformal barycenter closure. But that shift map is a hyperbolic isometry and there's an explicit formula for it. And that means that by the change of variables formula, all I really need to know is the Jacobian of the opening map. And that's the Jacobian of this particular hyperbolic translation. Uh, you can get the Jacobian, uh, and after a little bit of simplification, the Jacobian is what gives rise to all of these weight, this weight factor here. So basically it's J of hyperbolic translations. Um, and that was the thing you couldn't do with any other polygon closing scheme, uh, some of which I have personally tried, like projecting to the nearest closed polygon, right? Because you don't have an opening map in that case. Okay, so uh, we explicitly compute this and then we modify it a little bit because it turns out that uh, you don't really want to take samples where the conformal barycenter is very, very close to the boundary sphere. Those might not obey the newton kanarovich conditions, uh, and even computing the weights could get numerically unstable. So we make some modifications to the Jacobian uh, in order to make it more stably computable. Okay, now, I said polygons were a subspace of the product of spheres, but they're actually a quotient of that subspace. So this turns out to be a relatively subtle point um, until you draw this picture, at which point it seems obvious. Uh, if I take a shape of a, a polygon in space and I wanna think about it from some physics point of view, I'm like, oh, I only want to consider geometric integrands because the pose, the rotation of the polygon in space shouldn't matter. I wanted to do polymer science here. So I was like, I don't know, there's no external field. So all my integrands should be rotation invariant. And at first I thought, oh, that's fine. I can integrate over the big space and I'll just get more copies of my polygon sometimes in different orientations but the integrand will evaluate to the same thing regardless. So integrating over the submanifold of the big space must be the same as integrating over the quotient space by rotations. Unfortunately, that's not true, right? And you can see the schematic here. I have this big space and uh, it has uh, this Lie group action by isometries. The quotient metric on this space by the rotation action is arc length along a meridian. Uh, the measure on the upstairs um, space is surface area. And it's not true that the inverse image of every region of the same arc length on the meridian has the same surface area upstairs. This green one has a big surface area. This orange one has a little surface area. So actually the quotient space integral is different from the upstairs submanifold integral. And that means I'm going to need an additional set of weights if I want to integrate in the quotient space. What are these weights? They're basically the volumes of the SOD orbits. Um, you can do this. 
and you get uh, again this mysterious B matrix, which scales with the square of the masses, um, and tells you something about the volume of the orbit of the point cloud. So again, I feel like this is some representation theory thing that I just don't happen to know. Um, but if you do that and you construct this combination of eigenvalues, then you get a new set of weights. Uh, and with respect to these new set of weights, the reweighted sample mean converges to the integral over the quotient space, again, almost surely. So, uh, Clay and I, along with uh, Bertrand Duplantier and Erica Yohara, worked out an algorithm for sampling the quotient space in three dimensions. So this is an extremely well-studied space. Um, Milson, Kapovich, Koi, Takakura, Alessia Mandini, uh, Talman, there's a whole list of geometers who love this space because it's symplectic. Um, and you can prove really neat theorems about uh, its symplectic properties and its uh, cohomology ring and so on and so forth. Um, and the, the use we made of this symplectic structure was to say that, in fact, this space of n-gons in R3, well, each edge has a direction. So those are a two n-dimensional space of directions minus three because you closed it. So that's a co-dimension three condition minus three more because you took the quotient by SO3, which is a three dimensional group, is a 2n minus six dimensional space. And in fact, this 2n minus six dimensional space has action angle coordinates. There are n minus three angles and n minus three corresponding actions. And they're, they're beautiful. The conserved quantity is, if you triangulate the polygon, the conserved quantities are the lengths of the diagonals in the triangulation. The angles are folding around those, di uh, the dihedral angles as you fold the triangles around those diagonals. And any polygon can be obtained first by specifying the diagonal lengths, allowing you to build flat triangles, and then specifying the dihedral angles, allowing you to fold the thing into three space. And with those two things in place, uh, we gave uh, an amortized O of n to the five halves algorithm for directly sampling the polygon space. So this new method uh, will sample the broader class of spaces um, in essentially O of n time if the dimension is fixed, at least assuming that the number of edges is sufficiently, uh, is larger than the dimension, right? And the point is that um, the number of edges is smaller than the dimension, you're always trapped in a subspace and the numerics are a little weirder. <laughs> so here's some uh, performance numbers. Uh, these curves are sampling uh, polygons in two, three, four, and 16 dimensional space uh, with a number of edges ranging from eight to two to the 11th, um, 2048, I guess. Um, uh, and you can see the time in millionths of a second. So the time per sample is, uh, What's that? The 10 to the second line. So 100 millionths of a sample at the at the far end. Um, so it scales just as you'd expect, which is parallel to this line with slope one. Uh, the moment polytope sampler is in fact better for small numbers of edges. Um, but uh, as you scale, it gets slower than the conformal method. Um, interestingly, Though we proved it was O of n to the five halves, in practice, it seems a lot more like O of n squared or even o of, to the, o of n to the three halves. And there must be some theorem there. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> However, you can use the 
the polytailed sampler to check the conformal sampler and make sure the weights are right. So what I want to do now is show some experimental data designed to convince you that this whole weighting system really works uh, and it's not just made up. Okay, so the test integrand is distance between vertices in the in the freely jointed loop. Um, and it turns out that you know for symplectic reasons explicitly what these PDFs are in R3. So for a foregone with unit length edges, an equilateral foregone, the diagonal length between vertex one and vertex three is uniformly distributed. Um, it's kind of an amazing fact, actually. Um, uh, but you can do that one by hand if you like. So here are here's a reweighted histogram of a thousand samples, uh, which took like a thousandth of a second on my laptop or something. Um, and you can see that as I increase the number of samples, um, here's a million samples, here's 10 million samples. Uh, that took two seconds on my laptop. Uh, it converges nicely to the line. Now, this is reweighted sampling, so every so often you get a big weight, and that big weight throws off the histogram. Um, so we're still working on numerical methods to assure that big weights don't uh, occasionally mess things up. <laughs> OK, what about uh, skipping two edges in a pentagon? This is an interesting case because uh, it turns out that the PDF is piecewise linear, which isn't like too common in mechanics problems, right? It's an extremely weird PDF. So can we replicate the weird PDF, and in particular, the corner in the weird PDF? Um, here's 1,000 samples, 10,000. 100,000, a million, 10 million, right? So yes, uh, in uh, hexagons, this length of the middle chord is piecewise quadratic, again with a corner. And as you keep sampling, you can resolve that corner really well in the histogram. So here's a big example. Um, I have 100 gons, and I have the length between vertex 1 and vertex 50 in 100 gon. Um, here, the prediction is uh, uh, sort of a large end limit. This is a gamma distribution, which you expect this thing to converge to. Um, it is known explicitly, but it's a piecewise polynomial. Um, which is degree 100 in the pieces with enormous rational coefficients. So it actually can't be computed stably by Mathematica. Um, but here's the Gaussian approximation, uh, which is uh, of known quality, or sorry, the gamma approximation, which is of known quality, uh, again with 1,000, 10,000, up to um, 10 million samples. So you can see that for large polygons, it converges. So now I'll go into unknown territory. Um, so these are polygons in five dimensions. So I have a 10 gon in five dimensions, and I want a length of the chord that skips five edges that connects vertex one and six in an equilateral decagon in R5. Um, I, uh, Clay produced um, an actual formula for this PDF as a residue, um, but I can't integrate the formula stably enough to show it. Um, but it's really cool. It works by Fourier integration, uh, Fourier transforms, um, and some other clever tricks. Uh, but other than that, I've never seen this computed. So here's the initial histogram. And here's what happens as I increase the number of samples. So clearly we're resolving this, um, whatever it is, quite well. What is it? Is it is polynomial? Is it uh, something that's rapidly approaching a gamma or something? Uh, I don't think anyone has any idea. Um, and of course, uh, 
this is um, a high energy physics center. So I'll say that, you know, if you wanted to generate loops in five dimensions or seven dimensions or 21 dimensions or something, uh, we can get you lots of loops in high dimensional spaces. Whether they model anything physical is not my bailiwick. Um, and what computations you might want to do with them is also beyond my expertise. But I can certainly give you large, high quality ensembles to play with. Um, or download the code yourself from GitHub. Uh, so um, I'll just say that the first of these two papers has been accepted, um, and it's going to appear in this new SIAM journal, Applied Algebra and Geometry. Um, the second one is uh, in preparation. So uh, this is computing the conformal barycenter, but not conformal barycenter sampling. Um, another thing to notice is that there's a, a mysterious numerical phenomena where if you do something like close polygons by taking the nearest polygon in uh, the nearest closed polygon, even though the weights are all wrong, it seems to work once n is larger than 10 or something. Uh, in this case, this is probably provable that the large n limit of the weights is one. So uh, in fact, just closing uh, is good enough. That gives you the correct measure on, on closed polygon space. But again, you need to prove it. And to prove it, you need the weights. And of the weights, you need all this technology. Um, the last thing I want to say is, um, or the last couple of things are, with this we can do path planning in polygon space. If you want a, a path from one closed polygon to another, uh, just move the edges however you want and close it along the way. Um, if you want to optimize a function over polygon space, you can use similar numerical methods. Um, so this is perhaps, uh, a long awaited way to do the carpenter's rule problem efficiently. Mm. And then finally, uh, we think we can get freely jointed networks, at least in a reweighted way, by kind of hybridizing um, Clay's talk with this talk um, uh, in a clever way. So for this one, uh, I have a Simons grant, and Henrik had an uh, uh, academic fellowship uh, to come visit in Georgia where we got started. So um, thank you again. <laughs>